I'm going to start by kind of assuming you know nothing about dynamic programming, but I do assume that you already know about recursion and you know how to do recursion. So the core concept of dynamic programming is actually surprisingly simple. Like if you understand recursion, it's a pretty simple concept. Uh, and if you know nothing about dynamic programming, the best way for you to kind of get a feel for what it is, I think is to see an example. But before we do get into an example, I do kind of want to try to kind of say abstractly kind of what dynamic programming is. So essentially, it is a technique for optimizing the evaluation of recursive functions. Uh, and not just that, but specifically doing that by ensuring that if the same subproblem arises over the, over the course of the evaluation of a recursive function, you take that subproblem and you evaluate it only once. If it arises a second time, you will retrieve the solution from a cache. So you will keep a cache of all previously solved subproblems over the evaluation of a recursive function, and if you ever encounter the same subproblem again, you will just copy it from the cache. It's a very simple concept. Like, let me just first kind of illustrate it with just an abstract function. You, you don't even like know what this function is. It doesn't matter. So, let's say you have uh, some function f. Let's say you have some function f. And let's say f is just a function that takes a single integer argument. It, it doesn't matter what f does or anything. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have to be a function taking a single integer argument either. Uh, but as you know, like during recursion, sometimes a function calls itself and it can do so multiple times. Uh, you know, a function is not constrained to calling itself only once, right? Uh, so, you know, this, to evaluate f of 10, let's say f calls itself three times with some arguments that aren't really important here, which is why I'm putting dot, dot, dot. Okay, but in turn, these functions may call themselves again, right? Uh, some, you know, possibly even variable number of times. And, you know, you get f of something here, f of something here, uh, and so on, right? And so in the end, you may, and as you know, during recursion, you've seen diagrams like this, you can have like a whole tree full of recursive calls, right? So, uh, so, um, let's say it happens that you get f of 5 down here. And let's say you also get f of 5 over here. Now, the evaluation of this function, like this may in turn spawn more recursive calls which spawn more recursive calls and so on, right? So the whole concept of dynamic programming is very, very simple. Uh, when we, so, so in the course of naive recursion, you would just evaluate this exactly as shown, and over here you would basically have the exact, when you get to this f of 5, this is in a completely separate branch of the recursion, and you would kind of get like the same evaluation, you would get the same structure and do the same steps. The core of dynamic programming is the, with this one like amazingly simple idea, which is that, uh, okay, the first time around we will do this computation. But the second time, we, let, let's say we evaluated f of 5 and found that it was equal to 6. The second time in the evaluation of this recursion that we see f of 5, we're not going to do all these steps. We're just going to completely eliminate this, and we are just going to copy the value from over here. And we are just going to immediately say this is 6. And that's it. Uh, th this is basically the entire, like, theoretical concept of dynamic programming. Uh, you basically cache values of subproblems so that if they come up more than once, you can just copy the value from the last time you computed it. And that's it. Like, this is all the real kind of, this is almost all the theory behind dynamic programming. Now, you might be amazed at this. You might say, okay, well, how is that possible? I looked at a bunch of dynamic programming problems. They didn't make any sense to me, <laughs> right? And you always hear about dynamic programming being like so advanced. Uh, you know, it's like all these advanced problems are labeled as dynamic programming. How can something so simple be so complex, right? Or rather, how can something uh, that is said to be so complex be so simple? Well, uh, so there's three things here. There's three things that make this story kind of a little bit more complicated. Number one, and I think this is actually really not the biggest thing. You will learn this quickly. Number one is there's some variations on this idea, which you have to know too. 
And, and okay, I'll show you what they are. It's really not bad at all. Number two is that when we look at the time complexity of this optimization, the, like this is the really important part. The whole reason we do this is this is an optimization. There's nothing wrong, in like uh, correctness-wise, with just you know not doing this. You can just allow f5 to compute this whole thing all over again. You know, f5 can just be called in multiple places, and it's fine. But uh, this optimization, we will see how this optimization affects the time complexity of the solution. And one of the things we'll see is that how much this optimization helps you kind of depends on how you write the recursion. So part of learning dynamic programming and why it's not as simple as just saying, oh, okay, it's just recursion with this optimization, is because sometimes you might want to structure your recursion in a certain way. You might want to write your function recursively in a certain way so that, so that this optimization can help you the maximum amount. There, there can, as we'll see, there are like different ways you can sometimes write recursive functions. There's not, not always one way to express something. And expressing something one way versus another might have implications for how much this optimization helps you. And then the third thing, and I think this is actually the biggest challenge to learning dynamic programming, this is the hardest part, is really this optimization, you might be amazed because it seems so simple, but this optimization is incredibly powerful. It's like this one you know, weird old trick that like massively increases the power of recursion. And once you do this optimization, problems that you wouldn't have thought to solve before with recursion uh, are now, you know, you know, maybe because with recursion they didn't have good time complexity. They will now have good time complexities when you apply recursion plus dynamic programming. And so this technique unlocks so much power for recursion that problems you wouldn't have solved recursively before, you might want to solve recursively now with recursion and dynamic programming, which is uh, actually why I think this is the hardest part of learning dynamic programming. It's that to become good at dynamic programming, you need to become better at recursion. You need to think of a lot more things recursively. Uh, like a lot of problems are kind of naturally recursive once you understand dynamic programming. I mean, they're naturally recursive before that too, but before that maybe evaluating them using recursion didn't have the, time, the uh, kind of good time complexity, and now they will. And I, I think that's actually the biggest thing. You have to sort of adjust your thinking about how you, how you think about recursion, what kind of problems you think are going to be expressed using recursion. And you have to become better at recursion. And that's really the biggest difficulty of learning dynamic programming. If you do that well, the rest of the stuff is actually kind of easy. OK, so now I'm going to walk through more like a real example. Uh, of, you know, dynamic programming, like why it helps. We, we, we're going to see why this optimization helps. And then we're going to see kind of like a template of how to apply it. Uh, so what you'll see is actually this optimization can be applied completely mechanically. And what I mean by mechanically is there is no creativity required to apply this optimization. In other words, you could give an algorithm that takes a standard recursive program and translates it to a dynamic program, uh, a solution that uses dynamic programming with recursion. Uh, one you know, note I'll mention about the term dynamic programming. So the, the, as we will you know, see in the example, there are basically two kinds of dynamic programming. There's what's called bottom-up, which is the concept I just mentioned. The concept I just mentioned is called, or sorry, top-down. Uh, top-down dynamic programming is the concept I just mentioned. And then there's another one called bottom-up. And some people are kind of sticklers, and they only consider the bottom-up dynamic programming to really be dynamic programming. The other one they call something like recursion with memoization. So it's just a terminology to be aware of. Uh, in, it, it is also, it is pretty common use to uh, just call both variants dynamic programming. Uh, so I'm kind of using that uh, terminology here, but what I just showed is an example of uh, top-down dynamic programming. Okay, so uh, the first problem I'm going to show is a very like easy problem, and it's kind of a toy problem, but the reason I show this is because it illustrates, it is the simplest possible example that illustrates all the essential aspects of a dynamic programming solution. 
Uh, and then we'll move on to some more complicated problems and, you know, problems that you might actually want to solve using dynamic programming. This first problem, in practice, you would probably not use dynamic programming to solve. So this is like a very common, like, textbook example, but like I said, I think it's a good one because it captures in it essentially all the key aspects of dynamic programming. So this is generating the nth Fibonacci number. So you're probably familiar with this, like very easy program, right? You probably wouldn't use any fancy technique for this. You would just write like a for loop. You did this probably second week of programming class. But let's take a look at, the, this will help, this example will help us really understand kind of what, what it's all about. So the, the Fibonacci numbers, we say, uh, I'm just gonna use F to abbreviate Fibonacci. Okay, so we say F of one is defined as one f of 2 is defined as 1, and f of n for n greater than 2, for, for n greater than 2, f of n is defined as the sum of the two previous numbers. So you, you probably, I, I mean, I'm sure you all know, you know how to solve this using just a for loop. Usually people just solve it iteratively, right? Very simple. You put that, you first start with one, one, and then, you know, you just count, you just count forward, you take the two previous numbers and you say, okay, two, one plus two is three, two plus three is five, eight, 13, and so on. And, you know, often in a program, you might just maintain these last two variables, because that's, because you, you'll realize that's all you need. You maintain the last two, the, the last two items in the sequence, as well as like uh, an index of like where you are in the sequence, how, how many numbers you've generated so far, and then you use these two to generate the next one, and then you like, you know, update, swap, swap some variables so that, uh, you know, you're always maintaining the last two in the sequence. Uh, very, you know, simple program. Doesn't require any sophistication or understanding of dynamic programming, right? Uh, and yeah, that's true. Uh, however, um, it, it's really kind of instructive to see what happens if you try not to solve the problem this way. And then we'll see how dynamic programming fixes this problem, and then how it can fix this problem for much more complicated scenarios. So, uh, what if instead of, you know, everybody knows the definition, uh, but if you write, you know, the usual program you learned to write in the second week of programming class, well, uh, that program is, uh, you know, it, it, it seems maybe a little bit like, not very natural. It's simple enough, but you're like swapping variables and iterating. And fundamentally, uh, the Fibonacci numbers have nothing to do with iteration. So you might think, wouldn't it be nice if you could write a program that is kind of just like the definition of the sequence? So you might, you know, try some implementation here. Uh, give myself a little more space. So, you know, kind of like very simply, uh, th this session is not about like any programming language or it's not about writing code, it's about understanding the concept, but just kind of very simply in like Python-like code. So like this is like a function definition and let's call it Fibonacci and it accepts some parameter n. Now I'll skip all the parts, you know, that check the validity of the parameter. You might just kind of write this because it says something like if n equals equals one or n equals equals two, then return uh, one. Uh, otherwise, return uh, fib n minus one plus fib n minus two. Right, like very simple program. Just this is kind of the definition of what the Fibonacci sequence means. You're just you're just evaluating it exactly as per the definition, and now you're hoping that the computer will do something sensible here. Uh, yeah. So 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 just you know. Uh, it, it, isn't it kind of nicer to, you know, express the logic using, you know, the definition itself? Okay, but let's see, like, what happens in this program. And, and, and yeah, I mean, many of you have probably seen this before, and then we'll see how dynamic programming fixes this. Uh, so, you know, maybe, maybe even in, like, your first programming class, somebody, like, told you, like, why this doesn't work as well as you think it would. I mean, it, it does work, it's like a correct program, but it's not gonna work that well for like large inputs. 
Uh, so, you know, normally the program that, you know, uses a for loop, it generates it in order n time, right? So, like, if you want to generate the hundredth Fibonacci number, I mean, okay, your variables are going to overflow, those numbers get very large, but, uh, you know, as, uh, like, at least, at, le at least not c considering that aspect of it, uh, you know, it generates an order n time. It requires, you know, only about a hundred some, you know, times some constant steps to generate the hundredth Fibonacci number. But as you'll see, this is not the case here. This is kind of like a badly written program. Uh, because what will actually happen here? So let's, let, let's kind of check out the evaluation. Let's, check, let's do an example with f of 6. So let, let, let's see what f of 6 will actually do. So f of 6, I mean, it doesn't pass these conditions, right? So it goes here. OK. Uh, so it evaluates f of 5. So, so far, so good. Not, not, not really any kind of problem here. Uh, f of 4, f of 3. So, you know, we're kind of coming down in the recursion stack, right? And then f of 3 still calls f of 2. Okay. And f of 2 now hits this case, and it returns 1. So, so far, nothing, nothing st stands out. We just say this equals 1, and this value is returned up here, and now... Uh, now f of 3 calls its other thing that it wants to call, which is f of 1. Uh, this also equals 1, uh, you know, returns here, and f of 3 equals 2. So, so far, you know, nothing, nothing bad. But, okay, so now control returns to f of 4. f of 4 calls f of 2, which also evaluates to 1. Uh, and you get 3 here. Okay, now we go to f of 5, and now here we start to see a little bit, like, w w what the problem is. So we go to f of 5, and f of 5 is going to invoke f of 3. Now what does f of 3 do? It's not a base case. f of 3 is going to have to do some work to evaluate f of 3. In this case, it's not too much, but it issues two more recursive calls. f of 2 equals 1, and f of 1 equals 1 and then it returns back to, and then this value gets computed. But already we can kind of see an, a little bit of an inefficiency here, which is like, why did we have to do this whole thing, right? Um, hard to get a good mark. Okay, why did we have to do uh, this whole thing, right? We could have just copied the value here. This is a completely like deterministic function, right? Applying, uh, you know, applying the same argument all over again will always yield the same value. So ideally, we would have just copied the value from here to evaluate this. We wouldn't have issued these additional recursive calls. But you might say, okay, well, this was cheap. Uh, all right, let's see what happens with f of six. f of six now calls f of four. And what's f of four gonna do? It's gonna repeat like everything in this box, right? Like, like, basically, this whole box will be repeated here, right? Like, basically, this whole box will be repeated here. Just, a, just as, like, this box down here, well, just, just like this was repeated here, right? Uh, so, and here you, get, you start get, getting, like, more and more, oh, or sorry, I meant, like, even this one, too. Right, even this one. Yeah, so basically, um, it's just going to be less confusing if I show it this way. Like this whole box is going to get repeated over here. And it's like five different calls here. And the, it basically it gets worse the longer it goes on, right? Because, because uh, like what will happen with like f of 7, right? f of 7 will invoke f of 5. And f of 5 is like this whole thing. You will have to copy this whole thing. Like, you would, you would redo everything that was in this whole tree over here. So you can see that, like, this program has a very nonlinear structure. It expands very rapidly into a lot of sub-expressions. In just a, just a moment, we'll look at, like, what is actually the time complexity of that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, what, can we, what can we do to help? Well, the idea is, uh, what if we can just cache answers to previously computed uh, subproblems like, like we said before? Let's see how that changes the structure of what happens. 
So let's say, um, let's say you start with f of 6. Okay, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to like have a little cache here that maintains all previously, all, all previously computed values. So a value is computed only when it like returns up from the recursion. Uh, okay, so let's start here and let's compare the pictures. So we'll start with f of 6. Okay, so f of 6, now we check the cache. Cache is empty. So f of 6 has not been computed before, which is expected. Okay, f of 5. Uh, no, nope, also not computed. f of 4, also not computed. f of 3, nope. f of 2, yep, also not computed. But now f of 4 gets evaluated by like the base case to, to be 1. Okay, so, so f of 2 is 1. And we will now insert this into the cache because f of 2 has now returned 1. So this is a mapping between a key, which is like this value, or, you know, uh, a key which is the value passed into the function, and a value which is the answer to that function. So this is just saying f of 2 is 1. Okay, so now control comes back to f of 3, and f of 3 still calls f of 1, and f of 1 equals 1. Uh, okay, so uh, we insert this into the cache. Uh, now this returns, and now f of 3 can evaluate, and we get f of 3 equals 2. Okay, now f of 4 calls f of 2, and we check the cache, and we see that it's already computed, so we just return 1. Here we didn't really save much, we just saved on the evaluation of a base case, which is not really a real savings. But, but, but okay, we're starting to kind of see this work. And then uh, these two will sum up, and we'll return 3. And since this wasn't in the cache before, we'll put it here. f of 4 is 3. And now f of 5 will call f of 3. But f of 3 is already in the cache, so we won't do any of this work. We won't repeat this. We will just immediately assign it the value 2, because we're just copying it from here. Uh, based, on, based on this entry in the cache. And then that means that f of 5 will get assigned the value 5. And we'll insert that here. And now f of 6 will call f of 4. And f of 4 is already also in the cache. So, so, so again, we avoid kind of this you know, massive, massive duplication. We avoid, you know, here we would have had a structure that looks like this like this is how many subcases have to be evaluated here. We avoid this, doing this whole thing all over again, we just immediately copy the value from the cache, and that gives us a value here of eight. And we store this one in there as well. So, um, in fact, maybe a better way to kind of draw this picture uh, that really kind of exposes the uh, structural difference between doing it this way and doing it this way. Uh, so this, you know, th this thing looks like a tree, right? This is, this, this is basically a tree-like structure. It, you know, we, we had uh, something like this here, um, and here we have nodes, and, you know, this box is copied over into here. Uh, it, it's basically a tree-like structure in terms of, like, how much work is done. But here, let's, let's draw it this way. Let's, well, for, first for all the recursive calls that are issued for the first time, let's draw the box. Uh, let's draw the node. And then, f of 4 calls f of 2, and I'm going to draw that with a dotted line. Because we're not really doing f of 2 again. We're not really doing f of 2 again here. Instead, we're just copying the value from the first time we did it. So I'll draw this with this kind of like dotted line. And then f of 5 calls f of 3 over here. But f of 3 is already computed. And then f of 6 calls f of 4. And then if we had an f of 7, it would call f of 5. So maybe you can see what's happening here. This structure is essentially linear. It's, it's going to be a linear chain, right? As you, if, if I add, you know, if I add even more stuff, I add f of 8. f of 8 is just going to call f of 7 and f of 6. And this is just going to be like a linear chain essentially. 
And that kind of gives you a hint as to how much work is involved in evaluating this, right? Unlike this tree-like structure that is kind of sprawling and gets bigger the longer you go on, here it's kind of a linear structure. Every node just makes two other calls, one of, the, one of which is like basically new, and the other one is just kind of linked to something that was computed already. And so you, you kind of have this you know, structure that, that looks, like a, it looks like a linear chain. It's, it's, it's a line. There's only like n nodes computed to calculate the nth value, or n plus one or something like that, right? Whereas here, you cannot say that. To compute f of six, there's way more than six nodes in here. Here, it's just all shortcuts, except for the couple that are actually computed. Uh, so, so there's only like n nodes computed, and everything else is just one of these dotted line shortcuts to a previously computed value. So you can see that the structure of this program is very different from the structure of this program. I think that's kind of an interesting way to visualize it. Okay, so we will kind of like carefully look at the time complexity of uh, you know, this optimization in the context of this problem. But first, um, Let's just look at kind of like how you would set up the code because this is an introductory session. I do, uh, you know, it's not primarily about coding, but I do want to show how to set up basically like the basic code template for this kind of top-down dynamic programming solution. Uh, by the way, is it like really hot like elsewhere in the room? It's kind of like really hot up here, no? It's fine? People are fine? Okay, good, good, good. Well, you see, this is the, this is the top-down I haven't said yet. Um, it'll make more sense when I actually explain what bottom up is. So I don't want to like, you know, just know that for now this is called top down dynamic programming. Later I'll explain it and contrast it with what's called bottom up dynamic programming. Okay. So. Okay. Well, we'll leave this up here for, well, uh, no point. I'll just erase it. So now I'm going to give you kind of like the, 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 essentially like I told you before, applying this optimization to an existing recursive function that you already like know how to design is completely mechanical transformation. Uh, there's no creativity required to do the basic transformation. It's just kind of a template you can apply to all your recursive programs. Now you shouldn't apply it to all recursive programs because only some recursive programs benefit from this optimization. And we'll discuss which ones those are when we look at like time complexity analysis and so on. But intuitively, the ones where it matters is where you have a subproblem that occurs multiple times, right? If your recursion never generates the same subproblem twice, as happens in a lot of cases, then uh, you will not need this optimization. And it won't help you because if every distinct subproblem is only seen once, if for example, if, for example, in, in the evaluation of f of n, you had not seen, you, you know, if when evaluating f of 6, you didn't see f of 4 twice, then this optimization wouldn't help you. Because you're only caching the answers to things you've already computed, right? So it can't help you unless, unless, you know, at some point you actually find something in the cache that saves you from some computation. Okay, so here's kind of uh, how we can try to do this caching. So first of all, um, well, let's kind of write this like definition for, you know, I'll call it Fibonacci of n. Okay, so, you know, recall the previous program. The previous program was just like definition Fibonacci, of, the definition of the Fibonacci of n function. We just said if n equals equals one or n equals equals two, return one, otherwise return <coughs> fib of n plus 1, or n minus 1 plus fib of n minus 2, right? This is what we said. Okay, uh, so here we'll apply the template for dynamic programming. 
So here's how we'll do it. Well, first of all, we are going to need this function to pass around a cache. Because now we kind of need to have this, uh, to have a sort of cache. So first, you know, first uh, we can just make it, you know, to make it kind of less confusing, first I'll just make this a global variable. I'll just say, uh, I'll just say l l suppose your cache is a global variable, and it starts out just like as an empty collection. It's an empty map initially. So here you have an empty cache, and then you have the, and, here, and here's the function definition. So what we want to do is, before we do any work inside a function, we want to check, is the number already in the cache? So it's, it's pretty simple. If n in cache, uh, you know, Python actually has nice syntax like this, where this is actually like valid syntax, but like other, you know, languages that maybe you're more familiar with if you're not familiar with Python, uh, you can do, you know, if cache is a map, it would probably be something like, you know, cache.contains or, you know, contains key or whatever, if cache.contains n, uh, depending on your programming language. This isn't programming language specific or anything like that, of course. This is just a, an algorithms concept. Uh, okay, so if n is in cache, then just get the value. You know, return cache of n. I'm assuming cache is basically a map. As we'll see in some cases, you know, it can be an array for some problems. Uh, sometimes it must be a map. But more generally, you can think of it as a map. So cache of n is just the solution for f of n, basically, for Fibonacci of n. So, so this is saying, like, if we have already previously solved Fibonacci of n, then just return the answer. Uh, otherwise, we have more steps to do. Um, now, the template will go something like this. We will assign to some, like, return value the result of the computation. I'll expand, I'll come back to the section and expand it in a moment. But this is just whatever computation we would have done before. So we will basically more or less kind of copy this piece in there. Uh, you know, we'll have to adjust the returns so that they don't return, but instead assign this variable. Uh, then, we will uh, basically assign to the cache. So, so at this point, we have the result we want to return. But before we return it, we should assign it to the cache. So that we have it for posterity. And then we can return it. Now, you know, you can just assign it to cache n here. You can skip the temporary variable and you can just say, you know, cache n equals the result of this computation, return cache n here. You can do that, it saves you a line. Um, the reason I show it this way is because I, I do kind of want to show this as basically there are four main parts to this template. So number one is this, number two, number three, and number four. So basically parts two and four are what you had before. You had, you had some logic to return a value, and you had some logic to do whatever computation you wanted to do. So these parts you kind of had before. Here we will call it, kind of copy the logic from here. Uh, and this is just a return. You know, you, you had a return before. You need to return now. Um, and parts one and three are the new parts. They pertain to the cache. So the first one is just checking to see if the result is already cached, in which case it skips the whole computation. Or uh, you know, at the end, we must add a step to, you know, if we did do the computation, we must add the value to the cache so that in the future we won't do the computation a second time. Yeah, so uh, that's basically all there is to it. Uh, let's kind of see, you know, how, it, how to apply it here. So really we just need to copy this logic in here. So um, we will replace this line with something like you know, we will write if n equals equals 1 or n equals equals 2, then return value equals 1, else, now we need an else because we don't have to return here, else return value equals Fibonacci. And we're still, yeah, we're still allowed to call the function recursively and all that, no problem here. Okay, so we will just generate, get this snippet, and we will, you know, replace this line with it. Like this line, 
we're gonna like just replace. Okay. So so now, so now basically this is the comp so like this is the real computation. This is like the most meaty line. This is not really a line. It's it's like a snippet of logic that in the end should assign this return value. And then you will assign the return value to the cache and you will return it. Uh, I mean, different programming languages may have to, like different tricks. Like, I don't know, some programming languages may allow you to write like return cache end equals computation. And, uh, but the, the, I, I'm just trying to say like very generic here. Okay, so this is kind of the, the template. And this, like, what I want to note is this is any computation. Like, like you know, this this doesn't apply to just Fibonacci. Like, this logic here is the logic for Fibonacci. But this template would be applied to like anything. Um, should you also um, cache the base case? Because right now we're not putting one and two. Is there a reason? Or um, or could you initialize your cache? Right now we actually are caching the base case here. Because because here, like, see, uh, so our cache doesn't contain anything at first. Right. So what will happen when we evaluate it with f1? Okay, if uh, so, this doesn't get executed, right? It's not in the cache. Yeah. Then we will assign return value of one here, uh -huh. and then this will get placed into the cache. Yeah. So the way I wrote it here, like, this is kind of the most general way. Like, one variation you very commonly see, and this is very common. I probably actually write most of my dynamic programming this way. Uh, often people move the uh, move the base cases outside of the caching logic. Like they'll actually check the base case before they check the cache. Now, strictly speaking, it's more general to check the cache first. And the reason for that is because, in principle, your base case itself could take a long time to compute. This is very rare. Usually, like a base case is something that has like an obvious answer, like it's like one or zero or you know some something like that. Uh, but in principle, if your base case itself can take a long time to compute, you should cache that too. Uh, you know, by like uh, by returning without checking the cache, just you know, if you put this logic, if you just put like this line, if n equals equals one or n equals equals two, return one up here, it wouldn't really hurt because you you would just not like, never cache the base case, but it's okay, it gets executed very fast. Uh, probably on like it might even be a little bit faster because you. Uh, you know, map operations are probably slower than just checking one line that says like if n equals equals one. But that's really a micro optimization. So I do want to show it like this, including the caching of the base cases, because that's the most general pattern. Uh, but it's something to be aware of. Like in some solutions, you may see you know people checking the base cases outside of the caching logic, and that's fine too. As just be aware that then you know your base case logic won't be cached. So if that logic is very slow, that could be bad. But usually, it's, your base case logic is very fast. Uh, yes, question. How about just putting the base case directly in the cache so you don't have an if statement? Uh, this is also possible. Uh, yeah, one occasional pattern is people people put the base cases in here before they get started. Like, like the cache will be initialized to contain the answers to the base cases. And then you can skip this whole if statement entirely, which seems like a nice optimization. Uh, and you will often see people do that. So, so the optimization here would be basically cross out this logic, and here just initialize, you know, here replace this line with cache, you know, and then like a map initializer. One is one, and two is one. Uh, you know, basically initialize the cache with the base cases, and then you never have to check base cases. Is the idea, um, and that's fine too. You can eliminate this whole like block here. Uh, the you sometimes see people do this. The main problem with this is that in some problems, certainly not in this one, in some problems the number of base cases can't is is kind of like inconvenient to enumerate. As you'll see uh, in many, pro like in one variable problems. So here we are assuming that there's only like one variable, n. Um, and of course, this is already completely general because you know, n. We haven't assumed anywhere that n is an integer or any specific type. So even if you have like three arguments, the way you make it work for three arguments is you pack the three arguments into a tuple, you pack it into a container having three values, and then you use this template. So just showing it with one variable is completely general because n can be any type. 
But, but that's the thing. Uh, sometimes when you get into problems involving more than, like conceptually involve more than just one dimension, like Fibonacci of n only has one dimension, it's n. But as we'll see later, there'll be like a grid problem where we we're on a 2D grid and we have an x and y position. And maybe the set of base cases isn't like, uh, I mean, it's finite, but it's not, it, it might be like proportional to n. So, there, so for example, we might have a base case that says that if x equals zero, regardless of what the value of y is, do something. And that's why, you know, in the most general case, you do need some kind of, some kind of base case because it'll be inconvenient to fill the cache with, you know, it, if you had to write like a for loop to initialize the cache, then that's kind of inconvenient. So, you know, th this is probably the most general template, but yeah, there's some variations on this. They're nothing to worry about. They're kind of common sense things, like you can, you know, all the things I just mentioned. Uh, yeah, sometimes people do like to initialize the cache with some base cases, that works too. Okay, so hopefully like, uh, this is like pretty straightforward. Any uh, questions on this before I go on? Uh, everyone understand how like this, you know, uh, this implementation basically does what we talked about earlier with kind of taking that you know, Fibonacci function that was evaluated as like the sprawling tree and turning it into that more linear structure we showed where every case is evaluated just once and then if something is evaluated a second time, uh, we are just kind of getting it here. So this is the whole, you know, this is the whole point of this. Um, the first time around, this condition will miss, right? First time around, we will miss this condition and we will do this logic, which is just the evaluation logic plus assigning the value to the cache. These two steps were being done before. These are like old steps. And these two steps are new steps. Uh, and, and so the first time around, we will just put the value to the cache and do the same thing as before. The second time around, we will just always hit this line. And we will just always immediately return the value. And that makes it so that, you know, even if you're evaluating, say, like Fibonacci of eight, that, that means, you know, here you get Fibonacci of 7, here you get Fibonacci of 6, and so on. But when you go to want to evaluate Fibonacci of 6, you're not going to, like, start a whole new case where you do all this logic. Instead, you'll just kind of, it's, think of it as, like, linking to the past evaluated value. You'll just, you'll, just, you'll just get the value you had before. And by doing so, instead of making this a tree, this will become kind of a line of just skips. And th this seems like it should have like linear complexity because the number of cases you're evaluating is linear. You evaluate once for every distinct argument. And this is like the essence of dynamic programming. For every distinct value of an argument, you will evaluate uh, the function once. You will evaluate the function once for every distinct argument it has. Now, in the case of, uh, I, I do want to talk about what, what if, you know, your recursive function has more than one parameter, right? And I only kind of mentioned this, like, let's say you have f of x, y. What do you do? Well, take x, y and treat it as a tuple. Like, it's a two-tuple. Uh, it'll only match the cache if you have the exact same combination of x and y in it. So, for example, x equals 2, y equals 0 is completely distinct from x equals 2, y equals 1. Uh, but x equals 2, y equals 0 is the same as x equals 2, y equals 0. So this is just like any type, including a tuple type. And this is like usually how you do it uh, for multiple variables. And you can just make this a tuple. Uh, in Python, it's really easy to do tuples. But like most languages nowadays have, you know, easy, easy enough support for that. You just pack the values into a tuple. Uh, you know, in some cases, if you're using a hash map, you have to make sure they have like the right, you know, like some like semi-reasonable hashing function. Again, most, I, I don't want to get into the implementation details of this in most languages, but most languages have pretty easy facilities with which to do this. Most languages allow you to do this without thinking too hard. You, you know, if, if you don't know how to do this in your language, how to like take a tuple and apply it in a map, you might wonder, you know, uh, you, you might just like read about it. Uh, there's probably some document you can find somewhere about how to use tuples in, in, in a map in your language. Yep, question? Last step and the second to last step, and then having an index that they look through. 
Correct, correct. And I mentioned this earlier. Does this solution save on some components compared to Absolutely not. Okay. And this is why I mentioned that this is kind of a toy problem. Like in the in the sense that the solution you mentioned, the one that you know you learn in like second week of programming class, is still kind of simpler than this and is going to be like more efficient. The reason I mention this solution at all for solving Fibonacci is not because I'm ever saying you should solve Fibonacci using this method. It's because this is the simplest illustration of what the top-down dynamic programming method is and how to set up this template. Uh, as we will see, we will solve a much more complicated problem using the same technique where the solution by you know, another method is by no means obvious. Uh, but this is just to introduce the method to you in a kind of a already familiar context. But yes, you would, not, you would not actually solve Fibonacci this way. Uh, however, there is kind of uh, an interesting uh, link here, which is that this method is what's called, th this method of kind of caching recursion is what's called top-down dynamic programming. But there is another variety of dynamic programming uh, called bottom-up dynamic programming. So now we can see what this is, and bottom-up dynamic programming is actually very similar uh, to the kind of like naive solution you all know. So bottom-up dynamic programming says, yes, we also want to use a cache, but instead of just doing a cache on recursion, let's order our evaluation in a specific way so that whenever we need a value, it's already in the cache. And so how that would work here is you would just basically first observe that in the case of the Fibonacci problem, and you know, with some more complicated problems, it's not always so easy to see. Uh, but in the Fibonacci problem, we observe kind of very, very clearly that, that uh, the value of n, the, the value of Fibonacci of n, can only depend on smaller values, of, uh, you know, smaller arguments to the function. So Fibonacci of n depends on Fibonacci of n minus 1 and n minus 2. So in this case, we, instead of, like, if you look at what's happening in the top-down method, essentially we are kind of, like, just transforming the recursion, and we're kind of, like, just telling the recursion, okay, you know, cache the answers as you come up with them, but do it the same way. Evaluate the calls in the same order that you would have done it in recursion. Just, if you evaluated the same call before, just skip. Um, but another way is you can restructure the structure of the program so that you will uh, get, so, so you will evaluate the cases in the order, in an order, such that when you need a cached value, you already have it in the cache. We observe that Fibonacci of n depends only on smaller values of the function, and so from this we can get the idea that first we should, we should evaluate them in increasing order. So we can basically have a cache that starts out empty, and first, we fill it up with the base cases. So Fibonacci of 1 is 1, and Fibonacci of 2 is 1. And then, we just kind of apply this formula. You know, this is a, this is a recursive formula, but we observe that here, we, we don't need to do any recursion so long as we can just always guarantee that whenever we're about to do the recursion, this will always be in the cache. So if we can always guarantee that any recursive function we're about to call is in the cache, instead of doing it by a recursive call, we can just replace this with a call to the cache. Like we can just replace this with that if we know that at the time we will ask for this value, and at the time we ask for this value, these values are definitely already cached. So before this wasn't safe. Because before we didn't know, like, you know, before we would have f of 6 and f of 6 would call f of 5 and maybe f of 5 has not been computed depending on like what branch of the computation you're in. If this is the first branch where you need f of 5, then this is not computed. Uh, but if we can restructure the program so that whenever we access a value of the cache, we know it's already there. And we can know that by just, we, we can say, okay, let's evaluate uh, in order of increasing numbers, because we observe that higher values always depend on lower values. So uh, we, we, we get this idea that we can just write f of n like this if 
we can guarantee that when we are evaluating f of n, we have already evaluated all smaller numbers. If when we do this, we know that f of n minus 1, f of n minus 2, etc., all the way down to the base cases are all already evaluated, then we know that these are going to hit the cache. And we can just write the code this way. And then, of course, we can just kind of even write it this way. We can just write it like this. Uh, we, we can just take f of n and directly assign it to cache of n. And then, you know, uh, basically we just want to run this line for every number in ascending order. So, like, 3 will get 1 plus 1 is 2, and, you know, 4 will get 2 plus 1 is 3, and so on. And so then we just kind of surround this in a for loop. We can just say, okay, we want to start at the lowest values and go, you know, to the highest values for n from 1 to n. You know, this is kind of pseudocode, but for, for n, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, for what, let, let, like, big N be the, like, value we want to calculate. So, so uh, you know, if this function is, like, or whatever, I'll call it x so it's not confusing. So if we want to evaluate the module of x, we'll just say, oh, okay, for each value from 1 uh, going all the way to x, I will run, you know, this formula. Uh, and, and, well, except you don't start with 1, you start with, like, the first on base case, and you have to initialize the cache to the base cases. So, you know, you can initialize the base cases, cache 2 is 1, and, and, and then, you know, you just, uh, uh, well, I'm indexing, I guess, starting with uh, 3, yeah. So, and, and, and then you just run it this way. Uh, and then in the end, you would just, like, return, uh, in, in the last line, you would end up getting cache of x, and then you would just return that. So, it, essentially, uh, the difference here between the other program and this, they look very different in terms of the program structure, right? The program structure looks very different, but the concept is kind of is, is basically the same. The concept is that you want to make sure that every distinct value of the function is computed only once. There are two different ways that you can ensure that this happens. Uh, way number one is apply the standard recursion, let recursion run its due course. It's just insert this optimization where if you see the same subcase a second time, just naturally in the order that it would occur in recursion, if you see a subcase a second time, then you just copy the value from its first evaluation. And you're keeping all of the values from an evaluation inside uh, a cache. The other option, uh, so the first option was called top-down dynamic programming. Why is it called top-down? Because you start at the top. You start at the top of the recursion tree. You start with a value you want to evaluate, right? You start with like, if you want f of 10, you start with f of 10, and you make your recursive calls. So that's called top-down, because you start at the top. It's arguably kind of more natural to, in a way, it's more natural to think of the problem this way. You start with what you want to evaluate, and then, you know, you just let recursion take its course, right? Um, but the other approach is bottom-up. And it's called bottom-up because usually you have to start at the lowest cases. You have to start at the base cases. So instead of starting at the top and letting recursion do its course, you start at the base cases and you build up a solution until you reach the, the, you know, the value you're looking for. And to do this, uh, essentially you still want to ensure that every distinct uh, every distinct subproblem is evaluated only once. You don't evaluate the same subproblem multiple times. The difference is, instead of letting the recursion uh, basically figure out which subproblems to evaluate, instead, you just kind of order the subproblems yourself in such a way, uh, this is called bottom-up dynamic programming, you order your subproblems in such a way that you are sure that when you need a value from the cache, it will already be in the cache. So this line, this line over here, this was originally just the, just the Fibonacci implementation. Uh, so this is basically accounting for like f of 1 equals 1, f of 2 equals 2, this is the base cases. And then originally down, like this line, was just, was just this. It was just the Fibonacci implementation. But then we said, okay, uh, we, we know that since we are evaluating in this order, we are evaluating all the smaller cases first, 
when this line runs, it doesn't actually need to run uh, like the full function we had before in the, in the top-down method, because we know for sure it will hit the cache. So we just replace the whole thing with just, we avoid recursion completely, and we replace this whole thing with just access to the cache. Uh, cache n minus one plus cache n minus two. And then, uh, now if I was following the template from before, I would just say, okay, this should just be return value, right? And then we should do cache n equals return value. And then we don't return because we've turned this into a loop and eliminated the recursion, but we, we could have had this, and then I just kind of, you know, merge these two lines together, and I do this. And that's how I got that line. So it's really the same approach. I'm essentially applying the template from before, except I can avoid doing recursion uh, because I know that my values for sure will already be in the cache, so I can just write it like this. And then, of course, I need to do this for every n. So I, you know, I just surround it in a for loop to ensure that happens for every n up to the value I need. And this is very similar to the naive method you learn for doing this in, you know, second week of programming class. Except that method is just a little different because uh, you actually can, here what you're doing is you're still building this cache. Uh, here we're we're kind of still building this cache. The evaluation proceeds in much the same way. You know, we, we're just kind of evaluating it like this. 5 is 5, 6 is 8, 7 is 13. And basically, at every point, we're just taking the last two values and adding them up. Except here, we have some unnecessary you know, math lookups. Because this is kind of, I, I just did this in a more general way. Uh, specifically for Fibonacci, we can realize that only the last two values matter. So we can just keep the last two values in a variable. Uh, but in other problems, it may be that, you know, it may be that a particular value depends on all the previous values or depends on certain previous values that you can't necessarily predict if the logic is more complicated than just n minus 1, n minus 2. Here, n will always depend on n minus 1 and n minus 2, but, you know, in a more general problem, like maybe depend, n depends on n over 2 or something, and then it's kind of harder to, you know, harder to say exactly which values in the cache you will need, so you keep all of them, maybe, depending on the problem. Uh, but the concept here is almost the same as what you do in, you know, second week of programming class, except now it's kind of a more general structure. The idea is that any problem we have that can, be, can initially be expressed recursively, we can first kind of do this top-down solution where we, you know, add dynamic programming, we add caching just to uh, you know, avoid any duplicate, any you know, repeated subproblems. Avoid evaluating the same subproblem more than once. But then we can look to maybe optimize away the recursion. We can say, okay, uh, instead of even doing recursion, is there just a way we can we can order the cases? Uh, is there a way we can order the subproblems so that we can write something like this? We can write something where every time we are evaluating a particular case, like f of n here, we know that everything that we're dependent on is already in the cache. And to really, you know, I want to show this one last, one last thing to really kind of show uh, exactly what the difference is between bottom-up uh, and top-down dynamic programming. So, in top-down dynamic programming. Um, essentially, um, let's look at what I will call evaluation order. So this is how I'm going to define evaluation order. The evaluation order of the algorithm is basically the order in which the recursive calls are completed for a given argument for the first time. Uh, so let's see how this works. Let, let's start with f of uh, 5. f of 5, this is still Fibonacci, f of 5 goes to f of 4. So at this point, f of 5 is not completed because it has only opened the recursive call to f of 4. Completed is like when it gets a value. Okay, so f of 3, f of 4 get, gives you about, opens up the call to f of 3, so none of these are completed yet. Okay, now f of 2 is a base case and equals 1. 
And so here, I will insert f of 2 into the eval order. f of 2 is the first call to be completed. Now, f of 3 calls f of 1. And that means f of 1 is inserted into the order as well, because this is completed. And at this point, f of 3 is completed with a value of 2. Now we, now we come back to f of 4. It's not completed yet. It calls f of 2, but I don't put this in the evaluation order because here, in dynamic programming, remember, we'll just copy the value we got before. I don't really count this as, a, as an evaluation. This is just kind of, a, kind of a dotted line link. We're just copying the value from over here. So, but, but now f of 4 will complete. It will get the value of 3. And so I can insert f of 4 into here. And now, uh, f of 5 will call f of 3. Again, it doesn't count because f of 3 was already evaluated. But now f of 5 completes with the value 5. OK, so this is what I'm going to call an evaluation order of the different arguments this function is called with. Now, what is the significance of this evaluation order? Well, essentially, um, the recursion has found for you what is, I will call, a valid evaluation order. Now, what, what is a valid evaluation order? It is an order that respects the dependencies between these calls. So essentially, before f of 3 ha can be evaluated, by definition, we need to know f of 2 and f of 1. So f of 2 and f of 1 must appear before f of 3 in this sequence. The Fibonacci function has one other valid evaluation order which is that it doesn't matter which order the base cases are evaluated in because they're not dependent on each other. So there is, there are only, for the Fibonacci function, there are only two valid evaluation orders. It's this one and this one. For f of 5, these are the only valid evaluation orders. If you swap anything else, it doesn't work, right? Because, for example, if you say f of 4 will be evaluated before f of 3, this is not possible because f of 4 asks for the value for f of 3. The f of 4 call will request the value for f of 3, which will need to complete before you can ever get the value for f of 4. So we say that an order of evaluation is valid if it respects these data dependencies between the recursive functions. Now, if you've studied graphs, I don't expect that you have necessarily, but if you've studied graphs, this sounds really familiar, right? Uh, what is the concept in graphs? Uh, where we talk about resolving dependencies. Exactly, topological sort. So here's the thing, there's a very beautiful connection here between graphs and dynamic programming. Namely, and you don't have to use this, or if you don't know about graphs, don't worry, you can still understand dynamic programming without this. This is not, a, this is not like important for understanding the co core concept, but it is a very nice connection. Essentially, the action, the thing that top down dynamic programming does is it is essentially producing a topological sort of the uh, dependency respecting sort of the different function calls that have to be evaluated to lead up to the final function call you want to evaluate. And then it is, you know, solving this sequence by using this topological sort. Like f of 3 will evaluate here once f of 2 and f of 1 have been evaluated. So essentially, the top-down method is using recursion to kind of automatically, implicitly get the sequence and evaluate it in, and complete it in the correct order, in this order. The difference between this and top-down dynamic programming is quite simply this. In top, or sorry, in bottom-up dynamic programming, this is top-down. Uh, bottom in the, the, in bottom-up dynamic programming, the difference is you provide the sequence. You don't use recursion at all. You provide the sequence, and then you, and then you just run a loop through these values, you just iterate through these values and evaluate. That's the, that, that's the difference. So in top-down, we automatically get this from the recursion. In, in bottom-up, so, so this was like top-down. In, in bottom-up, we basically kind of are implicitly specifying the evaluation order. We are just kind of saying, like, I want to evaluate it in the order one, you know, f of one, f of 2, we said we would evaluate it in ascending order. 
So that's what we're doing with bottom up. We're just kind of explicitly supplying the sequence so that we don't need recursion to figure out the sequence for us. And then we are just saying, OK, uh, so this is the sequence. Evaluate. Um, and, and how do you evaluate? Well, basically, assume that these values are in the cache. Um, now you can just you know, give whatever evaluation function we have. So for us, it was like we, we said cache n equals cache n minus 1 plus cache n minus 2. And we see here this respects, you know, this formula respects this evaluation order. And top-down dynamic programming wouldn't work if the order we gave didn't respect this order. Like, let, let's, like, let's say we messed up, right? Uh, let's say we, we or sorry, uh, bottom-up dynamic programming wouldn't work if we didn't respect this order. Uh, let's say uh, we messed up and we decided that we were going to start with the highest numbers first. Like, instead of doing the smallest numbers first, we said, okay, uh, uh, I want to supply you a different sequence. I want, I, I want to evaluate the calls in this order. F of 5, F of 4, F of 3, F of 2, right? So instead of having that loop go from like 1 to n, I want the loop to go from n to 1. I messed up and I, I, I supplied a sequence that isn't valid. What will happen? Uh, well, this line here will say, okay, cache of 5 equals cache of 4 plus cache of 3. You don't have these keys in the cache because you're this one is the first one you're evaluating. You don't have the keys you need in the cache and, you know, key error or whatever. You get some, you, you get some bad result. Exception, key error, uh, you know, maybe some default value that you weren't supposed to get, right? So essentially, the, the bottom-up technique is all about supplying kind of ahead of time just by analysis of the problem just by your own knowledge of the problem, you supply ahead of time the evaluation sequence. And then you don't need to do recursion to get it. Then every time you evaluate a value, you can be sure that any other cached values you want are already in the cache because you're, you, know, you have an evaluation sequence that respects the data dependencies. So this, this sequence does not respect the data dependency. But this sequence does respect the data dependency. And so if I'm evaluating f of 4, I can just safely assume any value I need is already in the cache, if, I, if I'm evaluating in the sequence. So that is, and, and, so, so the difference is like, recursion does the topological sort for you. It kind of implicitly gives you this ordering. Whereas uh, uh, in, in bottom-up dynamic programming, you are responsible for supplying that order. So for Fibonacci numbers, it's very, very easy to supply the order, right? It's clear that you should evaluate lowest numbers first uh, because n only depends on values smaller than n. For problems that have like two parameters, or even problems that have just one parameter but some other problems, it, like, it may not be so easy to find out like what are these, you know, what are, what is the evaluation order? Uh, I don't know if we'll see it today, but maybe in the dynamic programming part two, we'll definitely see some examples of problems where it wouldn't be easy for you to say what exactly is the correct evaluation order. Uh, so, so it'll be better to use this top-down method that automatically figures it out for you. So then, uh, you know, to kind of distill it to just a simple, you know, a, a simple insight, you might ask, okay, when do you use top-down, when do you use bottom-up? Well, it, it, it's pretty simple. If you can figure out in exactly what order the cases should be evaluated, if that's easy logic to express, like loop from 1 to n, uh, then, you know, use bottom-up. You can use bottom-up. Uh, bottom-up is essentially an optimization on top-down. It's just, it saves some work if you can bypass the recursive calls and you don't have to, you know, you don't have to, like, push and pop the call stack, right? If you can bypass and optimize away the recursion, it uh, will result in basically better constant factors for your program. So think of bottom-up as basically an optimization of the top-down of the top-down method. Uh, if you can't figure out how to how to make that optimization, you can't figure out what is the valid order of evaluation, then just use top-down. Uh, just let the recursion figure it out for you. If, however, you can figure it out and it's easy enough for you to do, then you can rewrite your code to be bottom-up. 
Uh, in terms of time complexity, it'll actually be similar, right? Because each one, both methods, actually guarantee that the same case will only be evaluated once. Okay. So, so uh, now let's look at the time complexity of dynamic programming solutions. So, um, you know, for, for, for just a minute, we'll come back to the Fibonacci example just so we can use it uh, as an example to calculate the time complexity. So, first, uh, I, I think it's really, uh, you know, useful to see like how much, just how much this technique helps you. And so to see that, we should calculate approximately like, uh, it just in rough terms, what was the original time complexity of the naive recursion, right? If we didn't do this optimization, what would we get? So uh, you have, like, let's say you have a call f of n, right? Like, let's just sketch out the evaluation tree and then we can kind of see what happens. f of n, f of n minus two. Okay, and f of n minus one, we'll call f of n minus two and f of n minus three. So this is the part we need to look at right now. We see that this box is, it appears twice, right? We see that uh, this appears twice. Now here's the thing. Uh, pretty much whenever you have these kind of duplicated subproblems, uh, you kind of need to use dynamic programming because it means that the running time of the recursion will almost invariably be very bad if you have repeated subproblems. And the reason is this. You might think, okay, so what's the big deal? There's a repeated subproblem and it occurs twice. Oh, okay, maybe you know, I'll do twice the work I need to do. But not so fast, right? Because remember, recursion is all self-similar. So that means that if f of n resulted in two cases that were identical, if f of n generated two cases of f of n minus two, it actually means that f of n minus two, each one generates two cases of f of n minus four, right? If you expand it further, like this is like f of n minus three, f of n minus four, and this one calls, you know, among other things, f of n minus four. Well, look, each one, like, uh, without any kind of uh, optimization, each one of these is generating two cases of f of n minus four, right? So, see, see, this is why the time, running time of the recursion is very bad. We kind of saw this a little bit before when we just saw that the tree expands and many things get repeated, but now we can calculate in a very precise mathematical sense like how bad this complexity is going to be. Because, because look, uh, you, like from one call to f of n, you ended up having, like forget about everything else even, but just, just the calls to f of n minus two, you had two of these calls. And each one of these two, because they're self-similar, right? If this, if this one generates two of these, then each one of these generates two f of n minus fours. Like look, we have four of them now. So now we have four f of n minus fours. So how many f of n minus sixes are we going to have? Do you think? It's not six, right? It's eight. They double at every stage. Each one is self-similar and expands into two more. We're going to have 16 f of n minus eights. And so, um, what is like, like from this, we can just calculate like a, a simple lower bound on the time complexity of the recursion thing. Like we can even not concern ourselves with what is like the actual time complexity because even like a lower bound that we calculate is going to be already very bad. Because the question is like these keep expanding exponentially, right? All the way until you hit like f of two or f of one or whatever. Okay, so how many steps will it take to get down to f of two? You don't have to be exact, but roughly n, of, n over two, right? N over two. So that means we're going to have n over two doublings because see every time it doubles we reduce we reduce this count by two. Uh, so it'll take n over two reductions before we get down to a base case, or you know n over two minus one or something. I'm not really counting exactly. Uh, so that means that by the time we get down to base cases, we will have we will have n over two doublings. So we'll have two to the power of n minus two uh, cases by the time we get, we get down, right? Because it expands exponentially. We have two of these, and then they kind of like multiply 
you know, like bacteria or whatever, right? We get like four f of n minus fours, eight of f of n minus sixes, and it multiplies very quickly. And we have at least this many base cases to evaluate. So already we see the running time, like even forgetting about the extra cases we generated, like f of n minus three or whatever, just focusing on these like, you know, multiples of two, already we have at least this many base cases. So, so it, n minus two? Or? N over two, oh. division. Like, like so. We have like at least this many cases. So the running time of the recursive approach is exponential. It actually so happens that like, this is not even the running time, it's the running time is like a little bit higher. It actually comes out, it's like interesting, uh, the running time of Fibonacci of n is actually Fibonacci of n. It, it is itself, its own running time. Uh, and it's natural to understand why this happens because I mean, after all, the nth Fibonacci number is defined as the sum of the previous two, right? And how do you get the nth Fibonacci number? Well, if you independently evaluate the previous one, and then, and then independently evaluate the one before that, then the running time of getting the nth number is the running time of, getting, of doing that first evaluation plus the running time of that second evaluation. So running time of n is running time of n minus 1 plus running time of n minus 2 plus like 1 or something for the addition. But it turns out that doesn't really change the function much. So essentially the running time of the Fibonacci program is Fibonacci itself. Actually like many, like uh, some textbooks actually have this incorrect. Sometimes the textbooks say it's like 2 to the nth power. That's actually not like strictly as low as you can go. You can actually say it's the nth Fibonacci number. But uh, you know, 2 to the n is like a kind of an, an upper bound because every recursive call spawns at most two other things, so they get it from there. Uh, but, but anyway, we were able to come up with this lower bound. We were able to say, you know, definitely it's at least this, which is exponential. Okay, now, what is the running time of the dynamic programming algorithm? Well, we have to come up with kind of a general way of uh, evaluating the time complexity of dynamic programming solutions. And uh, earlier I kind of hinted what it might be, but let's, you know, make it kind of official. So generally, here's the best way to kind of evaluate the time complexity. So for a, fun for a dynamic programming function, count the time spent just in that function. Like, don't count the time you spend uh, calling other functions. Like, what I mean is, okay, so we had our, like, uh, Fibonacci event. And then somewhere over here, you know, so here we did some stuff. We did like some cache stuff, some constant time stuff. And then here, we, somewhere we called uh, Fibonacci, we said like return value equals Fibonacci of n minus one plus Fibonacci of n minus two. Right? Uh, and then like somewhere here we returned it. Um, and, uh, Oh, we, well, we assigned it to the cache. Uh, you know, we said cache of n equals return value. And then here we have like uh, a check for the cache, right? We have like if n in cache, uh, then return cache of n, right? That was like a, that, that was like a program. So, so, so here's how we can count the time complexity. Count only the running time spent inside this function. In other words, don't count anything for these function calls because these are function calls to a different argument. You, you will see why this makes sense in a second. So what we want to know is we know that in dynamic programming, we will evaluate this function only once per argument, per distinct value of the argument. So now what we want to know is how, many t how much time does it take to evaluate this function for one argument? And then what we can do is we can just multiply that by the number of distinct arguments for which we are going to do this logic. Uh, so, so for Fibonacci event, how many distinct arguments do we evaluate this logic for? So it's actually n, right? Because n may need to call n minus 1 and n minus 2. Those may call n minus 3 in turn. But we know that for like a starting value of n, we will only call the values between n and 1. So we have a bound of, at most, n different distinct functions. So here's basically you know, the formula. We say that time complexity equals order of number of distinct, and I call them, I call them states. So a state 
of a function is basically just a distinct set of arguments to the function. The number of states, the number of states is basically the number of distinct sets of arguments with which the function can be called. I say sets of arguments because you, you know you can apply this to a problem that has more than one argument. Like your arguments can be like x and y, as we'll see in an upcoming problem. Uh, but in Fibonacci, there's only one parameter, it's n. And so number of basically distinct values, well, maybe I'll say distinct values of arguments. So, so, take, uh, so take that and multiply it by time per set of arguments. So, so this is basically time spent per function call on just that function call. Don't, don't count the time spent here. Don't count the time spent in there because these happen for different values of the argument. Count the time spent in this function. Uh, so how much time do we spend in this function? Well, okay, this is order one. I mean, assuming like an order one kind of map, which means we're looking up from like a hash map or an array. Okay, order one, order one. Um, order one, we do count order one here. There's a variable assignment and an addition. We don't count the time we, we spent inside this function or inside this one, but we do count this addition. Uh, so, so basically, you know, we have, uh, we have like order one here. We have order one, order one. Uh, assignment to the cache is also order one, assuming you're using like a hash table or, uh, or an array. Um, and then returning a value also order one. Uh, that, that all assumes, of course, you know, your values are integers. If your values are like strings, then depending on like your programming language and whether you copy the string when you return it, it may not be like order one or something. So you do have to be careful with that. With like some, like if you have some advanced problem where maybe like your values are strings, you have to be careful you're not like copying the string. Or if you are, you have to count some extra running time if your string could have like a length that is not order one or something. Uh, so you have to kind of explicitly think about each of these steps. But here, everything is order one. Uh, only the time spent inside the other functions are not order one. You might, say, you might also say, what about the time spent to actually call the functions? And yeah, you should actually count that too. Just don't count the time spent inside the functions. What I mean is, you know, uh, to set up a function call, internally the programming language does some work like before the function is even invoked and control is transferred to the function, right? There's like the pushing and popping of a call stack and things like that. So technically you should count those too, but those are always order one. Those are always order one per invocation of the function. Uh, now, you know, don't get, don't get sucked into the trap of thinking that this thing that we just said is order one in this example is always order one for all problems. That is in fact very common and basically for all of the early problems we will encounter, the time spent inside each function per function argument is usually gonna be order one. And the, what we'll really be counting is like the number of distinct arguments the function can be called with over the course of the evaluation. But we will see, you know, in maybe some of the more advanced sessions that there are some problems where, for example, the, rep, the return value is determined by looping over some collection of previously computed values. So for example, let's say Fibonacci of n was defined as the sum of all the previous values. Like, let's say, let's say f of n equals f of n minus one plus f of n minus two plus f of n minus three all the way down to one. Let's say that were the definition. And let's say you had a loop here. Then this actually could be order n. Uh, it actually can be that the time for just, just spent inside this function is not order one even for a single argument. That can be true. Uh, so you do always have to reason carefully about it. Okay, so for Fibonacci, number of distinct arguments we said is basically n, because we can never envision it calling anywhere with anything other than one to n, right? So this is n, or like order n, whatever. Uh, it doesn't make a difference in the final calculation. Time per set of arguments is order one. So the time complexity will be order n. So this is the general approach for evaluating uh, the running time of a dynamic programming problem. I mean, uh, as with all complexity analysis, like there might be some like very like special case where 
this produces some kind of overestimate, and maybe like you do some kind of like ad hoc analysis to establish the time complexity correctly. Uh, you know, there can be that sort of thing, but for, like almost like any dynamic programming problem I ever see, like this is kind of good enough. If you can just count how much time is spent in a function, and then multiply it by the number of uh, number of distinct values of the number of distinct values the function will be called with, you know, you get you get an upper bound on the running time of the function. Uh, the, like the only time that analysis would like overestimate the running time of the function is like maybe if there's like one argument for which the function takes order n, and for every other argument it takes order one. So if you just multiply order n by the number of things, maybe you get it. Maybe you kind of overestimate it. But that's a very rare case. Because really, like really, the goal here is just to sum this. Like you're trying to sum over all distinct values of arguments the time spent for that argument, right? Like that's the whole, that, that's the whole point. You know that the function will be evaluated once for every argument, and so you're just trying to sum that up. Sum up the time spent for Fibonacci of one, Fibonacci of two, Fibonacci of three, or more generally in any problem, sum up the time spent across all the cases. But usually the time it takes per case is kind of the same, so you can just calculate how many cases there are, how much time per case, and then multiply it together. I guess this is always correct if you say average here. You, you know, you, you get what I'm saying. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, you, you, know, you know, it's uh, pretty simple most of the time. Now, one, you know, thing you might say is, you might say to me, well, wait a second, is it really true that this function is called once? Uh, only once for every argument. After all, even subsequent calls will still hit, will still call this function to hit these lines, right? Like even the second time this function is called, if this is called a second time with the same argument, well, it will like hit this line uh, and it will return, right? But the thing is, this operation uh, is only order one. So you don't really have to worry about it because it's not gonna spawn any more recursive cases. And in fact, you can kind of imagine a code just for purposes of like convincing yourself that it's perfectly okay to ignore the running time of, of you know, the, the second and third and et cetera times you call this function and just hit these lines. To convince yourself that this is perfectly okay, you can just realize that you could actually transpose these lines to the call site, right? Like wherever you call this function from, you could actually move these lines to the call site itself. Like you could, in other words, instead of doing this, like where you say Fibonacci of n minus one, you could apply this, you, you could eliminate this logic from here, and you could just apply it always before calling every argument. This would be kind of hairy and inconvenient, right? Which is why we always put the code here. But you can imagine like just writing it as like retval equals, and then uh, and, you know some conditional expression where we say if n minus one is in the cache, then cache of n minus one, else f Fibonacci of n minus one. So you can just imagine like always taking this and applying it at each call site. And you can see that this doesn't change the time complexity because, uh, because this check is always order one and you were already doing order one work to call the function. So applying an extra order one check can never affect its complexity. And, and then if you did that transformation, if you did transform it that way, your code would look hairier, but now it would actually be like technically true that the function can never ever be called with the same, you, you know, the, the function can never be called this a second time with the same argument. Here, the function is called a second time with the same argument, it just returns out right away if that happens. I mean, until we did that transformation. Okay, so this is the time complexity of the top-down method, uh, the one where we use recursion. Now, what's gonna be the time complexity of the bottom-up approach? So the thing is, it's, it's the same, right? Because uh, the bottom-up approach still evaluates all the same cases. The only difference is it doesn't use recursion to establish that fundamental evaluation order that I talked about, right? In the recursive method, the recursion automatically establishes the evaluation order. In the bottom-up method, you supply the evaluation order. But the cases that have to be uh, evaluated are still the same. The number of distinct values of the arguments uh, is, is, is generally like still the same. The same cases that needed to be evaluated by the recursion are gonna have to be evaluated by the bottom-up approach too. And the time per set of arguments also doesn't change. 
Because the transformation in the bottom-up approach is that instead of calling the function like recursively, like here, uh, you just replace, say, this call to the function, you replace it to accessing the cache at this number. Because, you, because in the, in the bottom-up approach, you know that this cache value will already exist, so there's no need to call the function, you can just retrieve it from the cache. So the bottom-up approach just basically performs this optimization, and then it basically runs this in a loop, you know, over all the arguments. Because now you don't have any recursion, you have nothing that will cause it to run over all the arguments, you have to run this in a, in a loop. So the loop is you're still evaluating over the same values of the arguments, and the, the time complexity here doesn't change because remember, we were not counting the time spent inside Fibonacci of one, we were just counting the time of the function invocation, and now we've replaced the function invocation by just an access to a map, but both operations were order one, so it didn't make a difference in the time complexity. If, that, if it was order one before, it's still order one now. So the bottom-up approach will basically still have the same time complexity. So um, essentially, it means that the, it, it actually means that the bottom-up approach can never have a better time complexity than the top-down approach. Uh, because it still needs to evaluate the same cases and it still essentially does the same things for the cases. So where is the win of the bottom-up approach? Well, uh, the, the win is that you don't have to call these recursive functions, this map lookup, or it, in some cases it can be an array lookup. If, for example, you know that all of your keys, you know, all of your n's are between zero and n, you can have an array of size n that does the mapping. Conceptually it's a map, but you can use an array, like a map in some cases. Uh, this, this operation may be more efficient than calling a function and, and you know, popping a function onto the call stack. So the constant factors can be lower. So with a bottom-up approach, you may win on constant factors. And you know, the difference can be like fairly significant. Uh, a function call is not like super expensive, but it's not necessarily nearly as cheap as, as a lookup. Especially if you can optimize it away to an array lookup. Uh, you know, this could be a lot more efficient. So uh, that's really where the win is. The, the win is on constant factors. You cannot improve the asymptotic running time. In fact, sometimes the, uh, the running time of a bottom-up approach will be worse. It depends. It depends on what logic you have to do in order to uh, get a valid evaluation order here. So in the case of Fibonacci, remember, we just did something like some like basic initialization. We said like cache of 0 equals 1 or rather cache of one equals one, cache of two equals one, and then we did some uh, like four, you know, whatever, four, we called this x, and then we said like four n from three to x or something, right? Uh, so here it was very easy, we didn't really, like th this loop doesn't really have to do much work, this loop just increments. But in some problem, it could be like very difficult to establish the correct evaluation order, and if you spend a lot of time establishing that order, it could actually bring your complexity to something higher. Um, yeah, I, I mean, maybe down the line we'll see an example of this, but it's not going to come now when we're still looking at simple problems. For now, usually it's going to be that the time complexity of a top-down and a bottom-up approach is going to be the same. But just keep in mind that basically, in the top-down approach, the running time is number of cases multiplied by how much time you spend in each case. And in top-down, it's the same thing, but with better constant factors, or sorry, in bottom-up, it's the same thing as with top-down, but possibly better constant factors. But you have to remember that to also add in the time that you take to figure out in which order to evaluate the cases. In the cases where it's just like a simple loop, okay, I'm gonna evaluate things with a loop, it's just like a loop increment, very, very cheap. But there may be some problems where you would actually have to run like an algorithm that maybe even is like not order n to figure out to, to figure out what order to evaluate the cases in. And then, you know, you actually are at risk of possibly having the top down, or of the top down being more efficient than the bottom up. Even though the whole point of the bottom up is to optimize the running time. Usually this doesn't happen. Usually there's a very easy evaluation order you can give, like evaluate the numbers from one to n or something, and then you save on constant factors by doing bottom-up optimization. Yeah, so, so with this approach, the running time of 
Fibonacci is order n, which is on par with what we had with just the naive approach we started with, which is why I said in the beginning, you, can, uh, you know, this approach isn't going to uh, you know, just beat the naive approach and never actually use this for Fibonacci. But hopefully now you understand what is top-down dynamic programming, what is bottom-up dynamic programming, uh, what is the, the difference between these two things, and you know, when you should use one versus the other, at least at like a high like theoretical level. Of course, to become knowledgeable about it and to really be able to apply these concepts, you will have to work through some sample problems.